Thank you. It's nice to see our Asian representative. Thank you. Andy Kim, House of Representatives, you're currently running to replace, are uh, you running for Senate? That's right. To replace uh, the previous guy in New Jersey who got caught with gold bars in his house. That's right. Right. So, yeah. um, I guess That's a first... big no-no in politics. Right. What do you have against gold bars? Yeah, apparently I'm uh, anti-gold bars. Yeah. Uh, Anti-Federal Reserve guy? Is that, is that your oh, platform? Uh, ouch. Okay, this is getting a heated <laughs> inter interview <laughs> right out of the gate here. <laughs> but what, what, what you're, you're right for Senate. Yeah, I, look, I mean, it's not something I plan to do. You know, I'm a, I'm a, th a three-term member of the House of Representatives. I got a six-year-old and eight-year-old, two little boys at home, so I was not, you know, planning to, to take on a statewide uh, election. But look, I mean, uh, right now, I mean, I, I'm sure the, the audience feels it too. I mean, we live in the time of the greatest amount of distrust in government in modern American history. And 84% of people in New Jersey believe that their politicians are corrupt. Like 84%, like how can... Well, they were kind of <laughs> validated. <one> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah. You're, so you're wondering what's wrong with the other 16%, right? Yeah, yeah. In terms are, they of, yeah. Just not, are they just not that educated? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I mean, we, we have to... Yeah, I believe that the opposite of democracy is, is apathy. It's if people give up on this, if feel like their elected officials are not in it for the right reasons. So I just, I feel like at this critical moment, we have to restore a sense of integrity back into our politics and try to do our best to give the people of New Jersey a choice. Sure. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're running in a district that, if I'm not wrong, voted for Donald Trump twice. Well, you're, my congressional district, yeah. yeah in 2018, yeah. I was part of the, the class of 2018 that flipped the House of Representatives, uh, sure. tried to you know, take that away from Donald Trump. Sure. And I won a district that Trump won. And in 2020, right. I was one of only seven Democrats in the entire country that won a district Trump won. Sure. So, yes. So, and you're been... like the... Uh... <laughs> so, it's... You, you won in a district that Trump won, and you're, I'm assuming, a minority in that district, both in race and... Yeah, my politics. district is 85% white, less than 3% sure. Asian. Uh, when I was first elected, there were zero Korean Americans in Congress. Yeah. And I had a lot of people tell me there's no way that an Asian American can win a district so, where the vast, vast majority... So how the hell did you win it? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, how the hell did you win it? Because if you won it, then... I, I, well, look, I, I, what I'll say is... No, that, no offense. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, no offense. <laughs> no, look, I, I, I think... What I learned is that, like, I'm not going to let other people determine what I am or am not capable of accomplishing simply because of the color of my skin and my last name. You know, this was... <laughs> this was, uh... This is the district where I, you know, I grew up. I did my entire kindergarten through 12 in the public school systems of my congressional district. I'm raising, you know, two little boys in that school system. Like, I have every bit as much right to represent that district as anybody else. And I have every bit as much right to represent my state as anybody else. I will say that is, <laughs> that is both inspiring to hear and a little gross. Uh, as, that's a lot of time <laughs> in New Jersey. I just, I guess that's... Wow, that, you're really New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, God bless. <laughs> well, I, I think you talk about this feeling in America right now. Uh, we feel very divided. Yeah. But in the House, you guys just had, you just passed this bipartisan bill. Uh, funding for Ukraine, Taiwan, we had the TikTok bill in there as well. Uh, Mike Johnson seemed to want to cross the aisle and work with you guys. What is this? Is this the beginning of some sort of bipartisan coalition or is this a one-time spring fling? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, uh, I think what he realized is he has no other choice. Mm -hmm. He can either be a speaker that gets zero things done for the entire time that he has speaker. Everything that he's done, whether it's passing our government funding or anything else, it's required us to, the, on the Democrat side to be there with him. I mean, basically, you know, he and Hakeem Jeffries are co-speakers of the House right now. There's nothing that the Speaker of the House, Johnson, can get done without Hakeem Jeffries and the Democrats. <laughs> and... So, so, look, it's, it's out of necessity in that way. I mean, you know, I hope that there are some places where we can find some agreement, but I'll be honest with you, like, I'm not holding my breath. Mm -hmm. We'll see where things go. But, I mean, you guys, you know, you all see it. I mean, I basically work in the world's worst reality TV show. You know, it's just like... <laughs> well, speaking you know. of that, I mean, you are, you are on the ground there. You, you know, you, presumably you talk with these people every day, if not all the time. You know, so I guess my question is like, how is it different to what we're seeing on TV? Your vibe on the ground in Congress. Is it as divisive as what we think it looks like on Instagram? Or is it, when you guys are in the same room, is it more like, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, Finger guns, towel yeah, snaps, yeah, all yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
how did you know? That's exactly <laughs> what it's like. No, I mean, look, it, it's it's very frustrating. I'm not gonna, you know, and I say that as someone who's never thought that I'd be in politics. I, I don't enjoy that aspect of it so much. But I mean, look, uh, you know, one of my one of my colleagues, I, I, I guess I call him that, Matt Gates, for instance. You know, he has this line where he says, you know, if you're not making news, you're not governing. And I just think that that is so indicative of what's wrong with our politics right now. You know, it's this I idea. You know, it's, it's this idea that, that you're equating attention with governance. You know, that, that's absolutely the wrong thing. You can see how someone who has that kind of mindset is then incentivized to just say crazy things. You know, so like I always think about it if you gamify Congress, you know, if Congress is a game and you think of what is the point system, you know, it's like people are chasing, you know, the likes online, the followers on social media, you know, the, the money into their fundraising, the, how many cable news hits they've done, you know, things like that. And like, you know, the, I have colleagues of mine who are more interested in being social influencers rather than lawmakers. Sure. And, sure. and that's, that's really crazy, sure. you know? Sure. Like, I get to work... <laughs> like, I get to work a job whose job description is in the Constitution of the United States. Like me as a son of immigrants, a public school kid, gets to do that kind of work. Like that should be a deeply humbling experience, not some platform for you to just go chase your ego and your ambition. Sure. That so, being said, <laughs> that being said. Okay. Just ended Kim over here. Yeah. Thank you for not chasing I, I attention. I handpicked every single one of them to come in from Jersey. You would so never chase attention, but we do appreciate you coming on our television show today. <laughs> uh, Thanks so it's much. not about life. No, no. This no is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a humble man. A right humble man, you. Comedy Central appreciation. <laughs> um, uh, I, I am curious, though. You, Democratic Party is an interesting place right now, and I think this last bill that just got passed had funding for Israel uh, with very few conditions put upon it. The more progressive wing of the Democratic Party uh, wants there to be more conditions with Israel funding. How do you balance that right now? Uh, it seems as if the progressive side of the Democratic wing is, is, is wants more from a Democratic Party that's not willing to give it. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, I think what we need is, is to be able to move forward and have as much leverage as possible. What we see is that, you know, uh, Netanyahu is, is taking a, a, a path forward that I think is very dangerous, you know, dangerous for Israel, dangerous for our, our world. And we need to make sure that we're stepping up to be able to have as much strength as possible to be able to end this violence as soon as possible. And I, I'll be honest with you, a, a lot of Democrats feel that same way. A lot of my colleagues feel that same way. We're just trying to figure out how we can have, you know, that kind of approach going forward while addressing, you know, the humanitarian crisis. I mean, there's a, a, a famine that's on, on, uh, imminent right now in northern Gaza. Uh, you know, that's devastating. we got to make sure that we're providing the kind of aid and support to that, while also making sure we're tackling all these other issues around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine, we have, uh, you know, we were trying to pass humanitarian assistance for the catastrophe in Sudan, which is something that doesn't get enough attention. So, yes, you know, we got to make sure that we're pushing forward in all those directions. I will say also... Your, some of your colleagues made news talking about, in regards to this Ukraine funding bill, that they're seeing Russian propaganda being echoed and talked about on the House floor. Are you seeing colleagues, colleagues echo this Russian propaganda in terms of whether or not we should be funding uh, Ukraine? Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's scary. It's scary to see how, you know, what we're seeing right now is basically a new movement of, of neo-isolationism, you know, something that's really about weakening America's position in the world. And, uh, and just turning, not even just turning a blind eye to Vladimir Putin, but actually enabling him. And, you know, when I think about leaders in other countries, when they talk to me about what's happening, first they ask, you know, what is happening in America? And the second thing they ask is they say, is America a reliable partner? That's what they ask themselves. And, they, and the answer to that right now is no. We, you know, we are not a reliable partner in the way that we can and should be. You know, and, and you see that with regards to Ukraine, and hopefully we're going to be able to provide some support. But that has a lot of impact in terms of how we're perceived all over the world with all sorts of other crises that are out there. So you know, this is one of the biggest questions that we have of just what is America's role in the 21st century? What is the value of the American handshake right now? And that's very much under question right now in the world. Right. And, uh, what, you know, just on that note, like, to solve a lot of problems that, you know, that 
are facing the country right now. Don't point to me. Don't point to me. That's something that's crossing. This that was at a that felt like. I can't help with that. The Asians all you know making it happen. But like, can I get? Can I get? Can I get? But like, yeah, a lot of compromise is required. So when you're talking to like your best friend Matt Gates, for example, like when you did say that. I think I heard you say that. You did say that. Your good friend Matt Gates. He went. Edit that out, right? Like when. When uh, when you are talking, is there some kind of like, look, we put the cameras are off right now, let's just talk, or is it always just, you know, this guy's always on, you know, everyone's always on, even in private meetings, everyone's still, you know, yelling about yeah. about Jewish space lasers and you know, like. <laughs> when when I came into Congress, I had a lot of people ask me like, do they really believe what they say? Yeah. And when I first came in, I, I kind of came up with category three categories. You know, there are sort of the traditional conservatives, of which there are very few of them left. There are the, the crazies, and you can, you know, mad libs, fill in the blank, whatever name you want. Mm -hmm. And then there are the cowards, you know, the people who know better, uh, but just, you know, for their own purposes of staying in their jobs, they continue on. I'll be honest with you, just in the five and a half years that I, I've been in Congress now, um, there are a lot more crazies than uh, that I, even when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, a, it's really alarming. I mean, like, they... Real, some of them really do believe this. And I, I you know, I, I remember it, you know, on the night of January 6th when we came back into uh, the House of Representatives after the, after the insurrection, you know, hearing their speeches, like watching them, like only a few feet from them. And I could tell, like, some of them really do believe it. Mm -hmm. the, the big lie, they've bought into this, uh, they, they're, they're feeding it. And, and that's what I find so scary right now. You know, my first boss in government, he had this line, he said, you don't have good government unless you have good people working in government. Right now, you know, if you have a government that's filled with, you know, egotistical, narcissistic, power-hungry people, you will have an egotistical, narcissistic, power-hungry government. You know, so we have to try to find a way to be able to stop it. But part of their plan is to try to make government so toxic, politics so toxic, that reasonable, decent, you know, people don't want to participate. And that just leaves it for them. All right. Well, you know, thank you. Prior your time, and um, as far as from what I'm hearing from you, I just think that uh, we just need more Asian people to be uh, running into <laughs> Congress to fix everything. So, Representative Andy Kim, everybody. <laughs>